The following video has been edited to buggery. To avoid YouTube copyright bots that don't understand the difference between copyrighted material, re-upload wholesale, and the legal use of such material for critique and review purposes, under fair use guidelines. Rather than changing it and tweaking it until it's unwatchable, instead I decided to put really obnoxious images of sea devils in every corner of the screen. This is why I haven't done reviews in a while, and thank you YouTube once again for forcing me to destroy content that I spent literally hours creating. <laughs> Legend of the Sea Devils. Yeah, it was alright. Honestly, what else could I say about it? A swashbuckling adventure where the Doctor, Yaz, and Dan come face to fin with one of the Doctor's oldest adversaries. I'm sure whoever at the ABC came up with that one is proud of themselves. The first story they appeared in, the main adversary was actually the Master, using them to take over the Earth. They altogether didn't seem that adversarial. In fact, they're actually culturally adverse to conflict, with a very honorific society. But when faced with a posh bloke in a suit or someone else who's wearing bad prosthetics, they seem to be easily led. The other time that they showed up, they were just the Silurian's henchmen. They didn't even control the Merka. So it's nice to finally get a story where they take center stage for once. I'd even say that this is the best Sea Devil episode. It's just a shame that it's also a bit of a confused mess, with many jarring moments, shots that don't make any sense, and a plot that bears the scars of a million cuts. Initially this was going to be part of season 13, but then season 13 became flux, and then this story got ejected, and repurposed, and rewritten, and it was filmed during COVID with all the limitations that that involves. The shot composition is all over the place, and it feels like massive chunks of the story are missing. I'd really like to see an extended edition of this, because what remains is definitely a decent way of spending 40 minutes. Oh, by the way, spoilers. This is a spoiler review. So if you haven't seen the episode, please beware. There be spoilers past this point, you scurvy dog. It opens with a dark and rainy seaside village on the China Sea. This frankly beautiful part of the world that you might only be familiar with because our news organizations in Australia keep telling us that China is building bases in it. Here it looks like the more drearier parts of the UK, and that's because it is. I've heard other people criticizing it for this, and frankly, it's kind of in bad faith. This was filmed in 2021. They couldn't exactly go to the China Sea to film, and filming in Australia was also off the table. Their choices were limited. It was either sand stages or beach outside of Cardiff. And I think they did an all right job considering Anyway, this lady is entering a village, and as she does, everyone runs and hides in their homes, all except this guy, whose job it is to guard this statue. He comes from a long line of statue guarders, but he's pretty bad at his job. By the time he gets there, this lady is already hacking at it with her knife, and she's hacking at the base to retrieve a MacGuffin, which will surely lead to another MacGuffin. Essentially, she is on a fetch quest. Fetch quests work really well for sci-fi. It worked for Star Wars, and oh dear. As she's hacking at it, the statue is cracking under the force of her knife, and then explodes, releasing a sea devil and the opening credits. One thing I've noticed about this era that's a little bit irksome is that the writers seem to come up with a cool image and then base a story around it, regardless of if it makes any sense. Take the angel episode of Flux. Let's make the doctor turn into an angel! Okay, but why and how? I don't know, it looks badass! Let's just make it a cool way to transport it to the division or something. I don't care if it doesn't make sense, just do it! Here it's, we have a badass sea devil statue. Let's put a sea devil in it! We'll worry about the details later. And yeah, it does look cool. It looks really cool. I would even say it looks badass. But it takes me out of the story wondering why or how this thing even got there, and why the hell does it blink? Anyway, the Doctor and Co. emerge from the TARDIS and discover that they are a couple centuries off. They insist that they are there by mistake, yet the Doctor and Yaz are perfectly dressed for the time period. Except for Dan, who Yaz decided to dress as a pirate just for a laugh. In an earlier version of the story, they probably knew where they were going right from the start, but they ended up changing that at some point. But they still wanted to keep the period accurate clothing, because it's frankly gorgeous. The Doctor looks fantastic in that, and so does Yaz. Watch as the Doctor nearly gets her ear ripped off. When they find a magnetic thingy ma what's it, they bounce some rocks off it just for funsies, and then we cut from this partially cloudy yet really bright and sunny beach to a dark and rainy village. It doesn't even look like the same part of the day, but they're just suddenly there. I had to rewind several times just to make sure I didn't miss something. But when they get there, the Doctor decides to be a bit of a bigot. Sea Devil. Land Parasite. Name calling. Much like the Ice Warriors, the Sea Devils didn't really come up with their own name. We don't even know what they call themselves. Sea Devil is just something that somebody called them in the first episode that they showed up in, and the name just kind of stuck. 
So to a sea devil, that would kind of be a racial slur. Hashtag cancel the doctor. Anyway, they initiate a plan to catch the sea devil in a net, which they couldn't possibly have planned ahead of time and set up, indicating that this script has been tampered with several times. But I foresee a flaw in this plan that they only just figured out, apparently spur at the moment, even though it's very heavily choreographed. The guy still has his sword. What did you think would happen? Anyway, as he escapes, the flying Dutchman shows up and he Mario dumps <laughs> onto the ship. No time to worry about that though. It's time for the doctor to meet a historical figure and we know how much he loves those. Allow me to introduce you to Zhang Yi Sao, also known as Madam Ching, Pirate Queen. I'm probably going to butcher the names here, so I'm sorry ahead of time. Zhang Yisao was a Chinese pirate leader, active in the South China Sea between the years of 1801 and 1810. Like many pirates, she was of humble beginnings. At the age of 26, she married a pirate named Zhang Yi in the year of 1801, and she took to her husband's lifestyle very well. After her husband's death in 1807, she took his place as the leader of the Pirate Confederation, and later married her late husband's adopted son, Zhang Bao. As leader of the Federation, she led from 40,000 to 60,000 pirates, and entered conflicts with the East India Trading Company, the Portuguese Empire, and so on and so forth. Eventually she gave up the life and decided to retire, and she did this in style, marching her men up to the magistrates and demanding a pardon. But even after that, she still retained 1400 under her command, and lived out the rest of her life in peace and prosperity. She was a total badass, a very interesting historical character, and was the most successful female pirate in history, and one of the most successful pirates full stop. The actress is a great likeness, but there are so many historical inaccuracies that I'm bloody certain that this is meant to be an imposter. Anyway, the reason why she was breaking the statue is because it contained information on the whereabouts of the treasure of the Fleur de la Mar, a ship that went down off the coast of Sumatra in the 16th century, captained by the great Sinji Hun. As we learn this, Dan has wandered off and is quickly convinced to sneak aboard her ship so the son of the guy who's really, really bad at his job can kill her. This goes about as well as you'd think it did, and it turns out that Madame Ching is actually piloting her ship all on her own. And she's doing this because her crew were taken by the Black Flag Fleet, including her two boys of six and three. She's after the treasure so she could exchange it for their lives and wait a sodding minute. I'm pretty sure that a ship like that would need more than one person to pilot it. Also, none of this actually happened. Her children were never held for ransom by the Black Flag Fleet. In fact, one of the main reasons why it was so easy for her to consolidate power after her husband's death was because she was on good terms with Gao Podi, the leader of the Black Flag Fleet. They didn't even get her kids' ages right. By 1807, the oldest was four, and the youngest had only just been born. If you're going to have historical characters in your special, you should at the very least make sure you get the damn ages right, or any basic information about their life. There's no reason why it needs to be set in 1807 after all. But for some reason they chose a year when A, she had had a kid, B, her husband died, and C, she had just become the leader of the Pirate Federation. Essentially what I'm saying is that she was busy, and her kids never got kidnapped. I hope I got that across. This woman is an imposter. Prove me wrong. She has Dan and Weepy Boy now, so at least now she can pilot her ship. So Yas and the Doctor abandon Dan and decide to find the treasure before the Pirate Queen does, or at least find the whereabouts of it, so they can get her on side and then deal with whatever the Sea Devils have planned. To do this, they will need to go back in time and see the ship as it's sinking, but they also need to know where it sank, the exact location, which is a bit of a mystery. They haven't even found the location of its wreck to this day. So surely they will need to go over some old manifests, find out where it last made port, sneak the TARDIS aboard, and wait until it sinks and <laughs> no they just know where it is because the reason is the year 1533 the doctor and yaz are on board the hang on hang on that's not the floor de la mar this is the floor de la mar Oh no, it's history time again, here we go, oh no! The Flor de la Mar was a Portuguese carrot ship, it used to haul heavy loads, and it had an extensive career in the Indian Ocean, till its sinking in 1511 off the coast of Sumatra. She went down in a storm while she was shipping loot from the sacking of the Sultan of Malacca's palace, and it wasn't captained by Ji Hun by the way, he's completely fictitious. They didn't even get the year right! Initially I enjoyed this episode, but the historical inaccuracies are just piling up and it just ruins it for me. I know it's just a TV show and you can't expect them to get everything right, but a great thing about the Chibnallera is the fact that they've used historical characters and settings to educate the audience. Fucking educate me! Madame Ching lived a very interesting life full of incredible events. There's no need to make shit up. Pick a major event in her life, involve the sea devils, it's that simple. Ji Hun is chucking his crew overboard. He's in league with the Sea Devils, who teleport onto the ship that is in the Fleur de la Mar through green mist. But he's been betrayed. The Godzilla fish is sinking his ship. So the Doctor and Yaz escape, taking the TARDIS under the sea back in 1807. And it's here where things get a little bit steamy. 
I feel like I've made my feelings about the Doctor dating her companions rather clear. But to the actor's credit, they are fucking killing this. The intense looks, the awkward moments, all going a long way to convince the audience that these two are definitely longing to be with each other. And the disappointment and hurt on Mandep's face when the Doctor ruins the moment is just wonderful. The Doctor points out, points out that there should be a ship here. When suddenly the sea floor breaks away and the TARDIS is yoinked by the god's illafish, and they emerge in the Silurian, oh, sorry, I mean Sea Devil base. The stories are very similar. I like the Doctor here, playing the fool, acting more interested in the technology in the base and pressing buttons than she is in the very real danger of the situation. This is a holdover from Classic Who, and it's an integral part of the DNA of the character. I say, what a wonderful butler. He's so violent. Hello. I'm called the Doctor. That's Romana. That's Duggan. You must be the Countess Scaglione, and this is clearly a delightful Louis Cairns chair. May I sit in it? I say, haven't they worn well? Thank you, Herman, that'll be all. It puts the enemy off guard, makes them underestimate you, and before you know it, they feel safe giving you a tour of their operation, telling you their plan, showing off their ride, which it turns out is the ship from earlier that isn't the Fleur de Lamar, and also revealing that they kept the fictitious Ji Hun captive and in suspended animation because of the reason. They also think the Doctor has a thing called the Keystone. Meanwhile, on the surface, the Godzilla fish shows up to attack Madame Ching's ship, and they man the cannons. As always, I love Dan's bland reaction to insane situations. He just lights up a scene. They shoot the cannons at the fish, but little do they know the fish has a special ability. It can spit cannonballs back at you and somehow make them explode. Even though cannonballs are just steel balls with no explosives in them. Nice trick. Back on the sea floor, old mate Ji Hun has finally awoken from his nap, and it turns out he was giving the sea devils the old double cross. He wasn't actually working for them. Really, he was only making them think that he was working for them, while stopping them from getting the Keystone, a jewel from his pirate horde with infinite powers. He gave it to his most trusted friend and crew member, who passed down the responsibility of protecting it to the next generation, until it fell to this boy's mum, who passed it to her husband because she just couldn't be asked. They were also tasked with protecting the statue. The Sea Devils, of course, knew exactly who Ji Hun gave the stone to, and where to find them. So somehow their leader decides that it's a good idea to go after it alone? Which it turns out was a terrible idea because the keystone turned into stone. I'm sure they just added the miniature guy in his hand for aesthetic effect and later on they added the MacGuffin for reasons of plot. The job of the Godzilla fish was to sniff it out. So now they know the Doctor hasn't got the keystone, so she forces the boat to the surface and the three of them, including the fictional pirates, swing over and the sea devils yoink the keystone as the Doctor puts the pieces together. You see, they need the keystone so they can flip the Earth's magnetic pole, which will make the stars go all wonky and more importantly make the Earth go round and round doing barrel rolls through space flipping it on its axis. North will become east, south will become west, the atmosphere will become compressed. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. The ice caps will melt and the sea devils will turn the world into a water world slash sea empire slash wine bar. After this revelation, they jump over to the ghost ship as the sea devils are reclaiming it. And we finally get a scene of balls to the wall swashbuckling action. The imposter man Ching gets some moments with Weepy Boy, the Doctor has a sword fight which she loses, and then uses her sonic screwdriver to fling the sword out of the Sea Devil's grasp, which honestly I think it's cheating, and Ji Hun gets to kill the leader of the Sea Devils. You didn't have to kill him! I'm gonna stick a pin in that and uh, we'll come back to that later. Because the polar reversal is starting! The ship is now underwater, and the Doctor formulates a plan. Her and Yaz will get some more alone time together, while Dan and the others act as human meat shields. You got that? Good. Okay, let's do this. It's here that we get the triumphant return of Evil Dan. Oh, what's the point of being alive is not to make others die. Oh, get off with yous. <laughs> I'm good at this. <laughs> oh. Okay, remember that pin? We're taking it out right now. Okay, um, so the Doctor was angry at Ji Hun for killing one of the Sea Devils. Just, just one. One guy who has already killed a bunch of people. Dan just sliced down six of the buggers. Does the Doctor know about this? Does Dan tell her about it? Who knows, I hope he doesn't because this is one of the things that the Doctor would kick you off the TARDIS for. I mean, honestly, Dan. 
You're crazy, mate. While Dan is on his murder spree, the Doctor is handling two very delicate situations. Shutting down the polar reversal and letting down Jazz gently. I love a lot about this scene. The bisexual lining turning on when she tells Yaz that if she was going to date anyone, she would date her. The light turning from green to red when she says that she can't though. Even little references to River and how she used to be a man. Honestly, I expected them to just go for it with Asman, but they surprised me by having the restraint to have the Doctor act in character and say no. The only issue I have is that this is already done and far better in the the episode School Reunion in season two. I don't age, I regenerate. We humans decay, you wither and you die. I have to live on, alone. The Doctor done goofed up, and they only have half the time now, so somebody needs to hold a thing for it to work. Luckily Ji Hun, the fictional character, shows up to fulfil his purpose as a fictional character by sacrificing himself, and they all escape in the TARDIS. Man Ching has the treasure she needs, and she takes on Weepy Boy, who is so overjoyed that it's out of character. And they all say goodbye to the pirates, who have a long career of killing and stealing and murdering and thieving to get on with. As the Doctor, Yaz and Dan, go back to the beach to chill in the epilogue. Dan gives the one-armed lady he had a crush on a call, and it turns out she's still into him. And Yaz and the Doctor talk about how they want to be together, but they can't, and decide that it's better to just live in the present, enjoy what they have while they have it. The Doctor makes a wish, and she throws a stone. So, that was Legend of the Sea Devils. And it's a mess. It's it's a big mess. It's a big, glorious mess. I try my best to be lenient on these episodes. They were, after all, written, shot, and directed under very extenuating circumstances with a lot of red tape. A lot of changes, a lot of cuts had to be made in order to cope. But it's the historical stuff that annoys me. Madame Ching is one of the most interesting people in history. It would have been so easy to take a random event from her life and make an amazing story out of it. Uh, mistakes like taking a Portuguese ship with a very Portuguese sounding name and depicting it as an Asian vessel, or making Madame Ching's motivation nonsensical, you know, given, given the year that you set it in and what she was getting up to at the time, or little things like getting the year of the shipwreck off by 22 years. It treats the audience like idiots and gives you a false view of history, especially given how underrepresented this era is, and how accurate Chimel Run episodes have been at depicting historical characters and settings. The story is also hopelessly over bloated. For example, there's no need to invent a pirate from the 16th century. And there is no way that Doctor Who writers are ever going to watch my videos. I am a tiny channel in an ocean of million subscriber channels, but read a fucking Wikipedia page before you start writing a historical character for Doctor Who. But anyway, that's just my opinion. What do you think? Did you like this episode? Did you hate it? Do you like my opinions? Did I make you angry? Did knowing the history ruin the episode for you? Do you want to stick sharp objects into my ears? Leave something in the comments! Like and subscribe! Like and subscribe! Arrgh! I demand that ye like and subscribe, ye scurvy dog, or ye be walking the plank! Please! I... I need the validation. Um... Please like and subscribe. Also, you should watch Chef Flag Means Death. It's a good show. Like and subscribe. Arrgh!